Welcome, and thank you for joining us for EMCA's The Legacy of Former King Constantine II of Greece webinar panel discussion. My name is Lou Katsos, EMCA's president, and I will be moderating this discussion along with Marina Valesis Casoria, EMCA's executive vice president. Our distinguished panel today includes author, investigative journalist, Nicholas Gage, journalist, author, Sp uh, Spiridula Irida, Spanair, educator community leader, Peter Stavranidis, uh, journalist, public relations consultant, Dimitrios Filios, and author poet, Nicholas Alexiou, professor of sociology and director of the American Hellenic Project at Queens College. Before we start today's panel discussion, uh, I'd like us to just have a moment of silence for the, for the recent tragic, tragic train, um, train, I should say fiasco to, to say the least, uh, that took place in Elas, a moment of silence. Thank you. Former King Constantine II was the last king of the Hellenes, his formal official title, and reigned from March the 6th of 1964 until the abolition of the Hellenic monarchy on June the 1st of 1973. Born in Athens, he was the only son of King Paul of Greece and his queen consort, the former princess Frederica of Hanover. Part of his childhood was spent in Africa during World War II, following the German invasion and occupation of Elas. Following the return of the Hellenic royal family to Elas, after the end of World War II, his father succeeded to the throne in 1947 upon the death of his childish elder brother, King George II, with Constantine becoming a, a crown prince. Constantine won an Olympic gold medal in sailing in uh, 1960, and in 1963 became a member of the International Olympic Committee, serving until his resignation in 1974, after which he was made an honorary member. He succeeded to the throne following the death of his father in 1964, and several months later married uh, Princess Anne Marie of Denmark, with whom he had five children. His ascension to the Hellenic throne was at a time, although years later, when Alas in some ways was still feeling the effects of the Civil War, and with society strongly split between the royalist conservative right and the liberal socialist left the ongoing and subsequent political instability leading to turmoil and violent social protests worsened in 1965. Although due to his youth, he was perceived as an agent, uh, agent of positive change by some, his reign was marred by this political turmoil, which eventually spiraled into the colonel's coup d'etat of April 21, 1967, who used the fear of a communist danger and which led to the Hellenic dictatorship of 1967 to 1974. Some historians denied by others suspected that Constantine and his mother Frederica were interested in, a, in the coup d'etat along with the United States, even though King Constantine II attempted a counter coup from Kavala in December 13 of 1967 which, less, which led to his forced exile with him fleeing to Rome and later London after a brief turbulent reign. He remained in exile through the rest of the Hellenic dictatorship and he technically was the king until the Hellenic monarchy was abolished by vote in June of 1973. Following the abolition of the monarchy, him, he and his family removed to the uh, United Kingdom and resided in London. A Hellenic law passed under Prime Minister Andreas Papadreou in 1994 stripped him of his Hellenic citizenship, passport, and property, forcing him to travel in and out of Elas on a Danish passport. It is a timely tale of diaspora Hellenes, just as Odysseus in the Odyssey, to return home, the land and place of one's birth. And former King Constantine II was not any different. The former king and his wife returned to the Hellenic Republic in 2013, 
and he resided there for the remainder of his life. Former King Constantine II was the last king of the Hellenes, which started with Otto in 1832 with the establishment of the Hellenic monarchy. From that period of the seven Hellenic monarchs, three were deposed, one assassinated, two abdicated, and one died after being bitten by a monkey in the royal gardens. Former King Constantine II died in, on January 10th, two months ago in 2023 at the age of 82. By the decision of the Hellenic government, he was not given a state funeral. After a private funeral officiated by Archbishop Yanamos, the head of the Orthodox Church of Alas, on January the 16th, and, uh, and a moving tribute by his son, former Crown Prince Pavlos. He was buried in Tatoy, the summer palace of the former Hellenic royal family next to his parents. Ultimately, the story of a person's life reflects the individual's legacy and what this panel will explore. We're now going to uh, start to introduce our, our panelists. And uh, for that, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, my co-moderator today, uh, uh, Marina uh, uh, Balesis uh, Casoria. Uh, she is the president of uh, Ideas Unlimited, a creative development consultant at the intersection of communications, strategy, programming, and resource development for social good, philanthropy, and impact investing. Marina served as a member of the public affairs team at Con Edison, managing corporate social responsibility, philanthropy, strategic partnerships, government, and community affairs. She is a certified fundraising executive and holds the CFRE International Credential in Fundraising Management for over 20, with over 25 years of experience in working with nonprofit organizations. Marina has helped to fundraise over $50 million for nonprofit organizations with a focus on social services for children and families in need. Her expertise in strategic partnerships includes education, environment, workforce and economic development, arts and culture, civic and community, ethnic and religious communities. Marina was the founding board member of Velpides, Greek Women Helping Greek Women, dedicated to supporting victims of family violence. Her community service includes membership to the board of directors of OB, OB, OBT, Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, the Dodge YMCA in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Center for the Performing Arts at Brooklyn College, and HOPE Program Business Advisory Council. She serves on the EMCA Board of Directors as Executive Vice President of the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance. She holds a Master's of Science in Organizational Leadership and a, with a congressional citation awarded by Congresswoman Caroline Maloney for our outstanding efforts and invaluable contributions to the United States of America. Welcome, Marina, and, and uh, please uh, introduce our first panelist. Thank you very much, Lou, and thank you for all you do for the future of Hellenism. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce Nicholas Gage. Nicholas Gatsoyanis, Nick Gage, is a Greek-born American internationally and critically acclaimed best-selling author and investigative journalist for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He is the author of many books about Greece, including Eleni, which is translated into 32 languages, receiving many honors and awards, and made into a motion picture starting, starring John Malkovich as Nick Gage. Nick Gage was born in Lea, a village in Northwestern Greece, Epidos, where Mr. Gage spent his early years with his mother, Eleni, and four older sisters. His father, Christos, had left to work in the United States. After World War II, Eleni and her children found themselves caught in the Greek Civil War between communists and royalists. In 1947, communist fighters gained control of Lea. When the communists began to retreat in the spring of 1948, they took children with them. Fearing that her children would be sent to communist countries, Eleni made arrangements for her family to escape. Nick and three of his sisters escaped but his mother and one of his sisters were left behind. 
1948, as civil war ravaged Greece, children were abducted from their parents and sent to communist camps inside the Iron Curtain. The communists arrested Eleni, who was put on trial, tortured and executed. Eleni Gatsoyanis, 41 years old, defied the traditions of her small village and the terror of the communists to arrange for the escape of her children. For that act, she was imprisoned, tortured, and executed in cold blood. Eleni takes you into the heart of a village and into the soul of a truly heroic woman and her love for her children. Nick is the author of seven, not over nine books, many about Greece. A Place for Us is an autobiographical memoir that relates to his family's experiences as immigrants in the 1950s. Greek Fire, the story of Maria Callas and Aristotle Onassis. Greece, Land of Light, Bones of Contention, The Burlata's Fortune, and A Loss. His acclaimed coverage of the Mafia led to two best-selling books. The Mafia is Not an Equal Opportunity Employer and Mafia USA. Mr. Gage was an executive producer of The Godfather, Part 3, co-writing an early draft of the script with Mario Puzo. Puzo. The, film, the movie was nominated for seven Golden Globe Awards and seven Academy Awards. Nick Gage is the honorary president of the World of Ipirotes and a recipient of the International Center in New York's Award for Excellence. He continues to speak throughout the world and writes for such publications as the New York Times, Vanity Fair, and Town and Country. Mr. Gage lives in Massachusetts with his wife, Joan, who is also a writer. And they have three children, Christos, Eleni, and Marina. A special thank you to Eleni for introducing us. Thank you, Nick, for joining us at EMCA for the legacy of King Constantine II of Elas. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I um, actually came to know King Constantine um, as a result of the publication of my book, Eleni, in 1983. He, uh, one Sunday, like today, he called, I, I got a phone call and I, and, uh, I said, who is this? And uh, this is uh, King Constantine. I thought it was somebody playing a joke. And I said, who gave you my number? And he told me who, and I knew it, who it was. Anyway, he wanted, uh, he uh, had, uh, someone had given him his book and he wanted to buy um, um, uh, several uh, dozen books. And um, I put his uh, secretary in touch of my publisher and uh, he distributed the book to all the royal families of Europe. <laughs> so, so I, I'm, uh, I, I owe him for that. Uh, later, he came to visit me at my house. He was visiting a friend in Boston. And, uh, and uh, the friend called me and asked me. He, he wanted to uh, meet my sisters. And um, he, um, he came to the house. He was very... Uh, warm and cordial um, and um, then and we met several other times at uh, events in New York through our mutual uh, uh, friend Aleko Papamarco and um, he invited me to some events in um, in uh, that uh, he, he held like the famous uh, a birthday party that he gave 21st birthday for his uh, daughter and I think 40th first for his wife uh, at uh, uh, at Claridge's in um, uh, in London, where all the um, uh, European royals gathered for the celebration, and um, um, I, he um, I remember um, he uh, he had a sense of humor. Um, he, we got in the elevator one day, my wife and I, and. Uh, uh, he was in it with his wife, and the elevator stopped on a, on, a, a, on the lower floor, and the king of Spain and his wife came, uh, walked in the elevator, and he said, one more king and we'd have a full house. <laughs> he, um, uh, 
he was a nice guy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I told him early enough that I'm not a monarchist. I don't believe the people who created democracy should be ruled by uh, kings or queens. Um, but um, um, uh, I thought he was, um, uh, I admired him because he loved Greece, I think, uh, as much as we do. I think, uh, uh, although he made made mistakes in his uh, uh, when he was uh, in his early years as king, um, he uh, all the decisions he took, um, many of whom were uh, uh, cost him personally, were um, in, in consideration of what would be best for Greece. For example, I think um, after the junta fell, if if, uh, if he had taken the plane and gone to uh, uh, Athens first. He would have been a hero in Greece because, after all, uh, the junta uh, ousted him. Uh, um, uh, but he didn't do it uh, because he wanted uh, uh, to let uh, uh, a political life return to normal. And then, when the plebiscite was held, uh, he um, could have gone and uh, defied uh, the order of the government and gone and campaigned directly. He and 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 um, and done better. Uh, um, and, but he didn't do that because he didn't want to cause conflict in the country. Um, I, uh, every time I met him, he always talked about what was going on in Greece. He spoke terrific Greek. Uh, he, um, uh, his dream was to um, uh, return to Greece, which he finally did in uh, uh, 2000. Um, Thirteen, and um, when he bought a house in um, in Porto Heli, um, a, a few years later, I did an article for, with my wife uh, on him for uh, Town and Country. I interviewed him many times, and his discussions were always about um, what would be good for Greece. Um, he, uh, 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 I think that people who um, uh, would refer to him as Glucksburg and uh, a, uh, a not a foreigner, uh, uh, do him a great injustice. Uh, um, my uh, 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 my parents were called Gazoyanis, they're from Greece, but that doesn't mean that my grandchildren are not Americans. Um, he was born in Greece, he, he was raised in Greece, he Brought honor to Greece through his uh, um, through his uh, performances in the Olympics, and he tried to do, uh, to do the best for the country when he was king. Unfortunately, it did not always work out that way. Um, uh, his, uh, his when I interviewed him, which was uh, several years before uh, he, his death, he he was very clear that he wanted um, to. Um, uh, 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 to uh, be buried in Greece and and be part of the of the of the, of, the, of of Greece. He, uh, uh, I wrote in the article during our conversation. Constantine confided that he had already decided where he wanted to be buried, the royal cemetery on the grounds of Tatoi, where he played in the garden as a child, and where he brought classmates home for parties and balls when he was a young man. Quote, my family doesn't like it when I talk about it, but I've chosen the spot, he said, that part of where the graves are shadowed by blossoming hickory trees, farther down and a little to the left of my father, facing toward the sea. <clears throat> Though he was like Odysseus, he returned home, and um, there he remains. And history can judge him, but um, my estimate of him is that he was uh, a good and decent man. Thank you so much, Nicholas. And uh, and I think you said it correctly. You know, he he was a Hellene, 
And I think the, the nastiness with regards to the, the name of where his family came from was, was um, most unfortunate, most unfortunate. And the fact also that they didn't give him the proper, uh, you know, funeral in, uh, in my estimation was, uh, was a, a mark against the, uh, the Republic, the Republic of, um, of Elas. Uh, thank you again. Uh, our next panelist uh, that I'd like to introduce is Spiridula Irida Spaner. Writing was uh, uh, Spiridula's great love. And as soon as she finished high school, along with her studies, she started working at the newspaper Replay. She continued her career in Democratic Logo, Radigny, Acropolis, and the radio station Cool FM, and later worked at ERT, in the morning show, Ali Meda. In the 2000s, apart from Catherine where she uh, currently works, she, uh, she worked also in uh, Eurosport and then in Alpha Digital, and later in the Athens 2004 organizing committee, where she headed the weightlifting press center for the Olympic and Paralympic games. In 2020, Spiridula was honored with the highest award of the Botsi Foundation for her research on doping and her interviews with world sports figures. She became the first editor in the history of Greek sports reporting to be awarded the nation's highest and top journalistic prize. She was also awarded by the World Movement of Hellenic Speaking Women for her contribution in the Hellenic language through sports reporting and by the Weightlifting uh, uh, Federation as the head of the press office for the world championship held in 2015 in the Hellenic Republic. Her sports reporting includes work with various sports federations, as well as working with very, uh, various sports institutions and associations all over the Hellenic Republic. In 2005, she became the first woman to be elected to the board of directors of the Pan-Hellenic Association of Sports Press. In the last 20 years, she has worked with all major international sports events, including in the Hellenic Republic, in the, in the field of press and promotion, which included the sports of weightlifting, wrestling, judo, gymnastics, canoeing, yakking, sailing, boxing, karate, athletics, rowing, beach volleyball, and That's we it. can go on. From 2015 and to, until 2022, she was in charge of the press office of the international sailing event, Aegean Rally. Her studies include uh, business administration and public relations, Hellenic culture at the uh, Hellenic Open University with po postgraduate work in journalism and new media at the University of the Peloponnese. From 2005 to 2019, uh, uh, she also taught general journalism and the Hellenic language at uh, Aik Akmi. Her writing has included editing the book on the life of various Olympians. Uh, in the Hellenic Olympians uh, book that is, uh, has been published while participating in the book of, of Katerimini on King Constantine II. Welcome Spiridula. Spiridula uh, Thamasmelisistaelinika. We, we welcome her. She will be speaking in the Hellenic language from the great country of the Hellenic Republic. Θα σας μιλήσω στη γλώσσα που προτιμούσε να μιλάει και ο ίδιος ο Κωνσταντίνος. Εξάλλου, ε, κάθε φορά που βρισκόμασταν σε κάποια θετική διοργάνωση, έλεγε ότι χαίρομαι που σας βλέπω γιατί μαζί σας μπορώ να μιλάω ελληνικά. Ε, ο Κωνσταντίνος αγαπούσε τον αθλητισμό. Από μικρό παιδί ασχολήθηκε με τον αθλητισμό. Όλοι τον γνωρίζουν ως χρυσό λιβιονίκη της ισκεπλοείας. Όμως είχε ασχοληθεί με το καράτε, το επικοντό ε, και γενικά ε, αγαπούσε τον αθλητισμό τόσο ως θεατής όσο και ως αγωνιζόμενος. Ας δούμε όμως πώς ξεκίνησε η σχέση του με, την, ε, με το άθλημα της ισκεπλοείας. Ο πατέρας του, ο βασιλιάς Παύλος, είχε ένα καραβάκι το οποίο, με το οποίο πήγαινε για ψάρεμα, κάτω στο μικρολίμανο. Ε, μαζί του έπαιρνε και τον Κωνσταντίνο και την αδερφή του Σοφία. 
Κάποια στιγμή ο Κωνσταντίνος και η Σοφία θέλησαν να μάθουν καλύτερα ιστιοπλοεία. Έτσι πήγαν στον καλύτερο αθλητή εκείνης της εποχής που ήταν ο Οδυσσέας Ισκιτζόγλου. Ξεκίνησαν να κάνουν ιστιοπλοεία στα Dragon και εδώ θα πούμε ότι τα Dragon, η κατηγορία της ιστιοπλοείας, ήταν η αγαπημένη των βασιλιάδων. Κάθε μέλος της βασιλικής οικογένειας είχε και ένα σκάφος Dragon και όλοι μαζί διοργάνωναν ε, αγώνες του Μικρολίμανο. Δηλαδή και Dragon ο Παύλος ή και Dragon η Φρυδερίκη είχαν τα δικά τους ε, σκάφη. Σιγά σιγά ο Κωνσταντίνος μαζί με τον Εσχιτζόγλου τον Οδυσσέα και με τη Σοφία πήγαιναν από το καλό στο καλύτερο που λέμε στην Ελλάδα. Και εκεί κατάλαβαν ότι μπορούν να πάρουν μέρος και σε ολυμπιακούς αγώνες. Έφεραν τότε για προπονητή στην Ελλάδα τον Πολ Έλφστρομ. Ο Πολ Έλφστρομ είναι ένα, υπήρξε ιερό τέρας της παγκόσμιας ιστοπλοείας με πολλά ολυμπιακά μετάλλια. Συνέχισαν τις προπονήσεις του και κάποια στιγμή ο Ισκιτζόγλου ε, κατάλαβε ότι μπορούν να πάνε πέρα από μία απλή συμμετοχή στους Ολυμπιακούς Αγώνες. Δηλαδή μπορούσαν να διεκδικήσουν ένα μετάλλιο. Όμως για να γινόταν αυτό έπρεπε να φύγει η Σοφία από το πλήρωμα γιατί χρειάζονταν έναν άντρα για, να, για δύναμη. Και εκεί ο Ισκιτζόγλου όπως μου έχει πει, σε, έχει δηλώσει, μηχανέφτηκε ένα κόλπο ε, Είπε στον Κωνσταντίνο, ε, η ιστιοπλοεία είναι ένα άθλημα που μένουμε πολλές ώρες μέσα στη θάλασσα. Εάν χρειαστεί να πάμε τουαλέτα, εμείς που είμαστε άντρες, θα πάμε πίσω στη δρύμνη ε, και είμαστε άντρες. Πώς θα το κάνουμε όμως αυτό μπροστά σε μια πριγκίπισσα. <laughs> λοιπόν, και με αυτό το κόλπο, ε, ο Κωνσταντίνος είπε, θα το πω στη μητέρα μου τη Φρυδερίκη, Πήγε τη Εωβράδη, το είπε στη μητέρα του και από εκείνη την ημέρα η Σοφία δεν ξανακατέβηκε στο μικρολίμα να κάνει στην πλοεία. Και τη θέση της στο πλήρωμα πήρε ο Γιώργος Ζαΐνης. Έτσι σχηματίστηκε μια πολύ δυνατή ομάδα, η οποία ταξίδευσε 40 ημέρες πριν από τους Ολυμπιακούς, ταξίδευσε στη Ρώμη. Ε, για την ακρίβεια έφυγαν 13 Ιουλίου, ένα αριθμό που αναμενόταν να είναι γούρικος, γιατί έτυχε 13 να τους δώσουν και τον αριθμό στα πανιά του Νηρέα, όπως ονομαζόταν το σκάφος τους. Οπότε το 13 ήταν γούρικος για την ελληνική αποστολή ο αριθμός. Λοιπόν, από εκεί και πέρα πήγαν στο εξωτερικό, πήραν μέρος σε διάφορους αγώνες, έμαθαν τα νερά της Νάπολης και ξεκίνησε η διοργάνωση. Ε, σε κάθε ιστοδρομία το σκάφος του Κωνσταντίνου μαζί με τους άλλους δυο ιστοπλόους ήταν ε, μέσα στα καλύτερα. Μάλιστα, ε, δύο κούρσες πριν από το τέλος ήταν σίγουρο ότι θα πάρουν μετάλλιο. Πήγαν πάρα πολύ καλά και στις δύο τελευταίες κούρσες και κατέκτησαν την πρώτη θέση. Λίγο πριν φτάσουν ε, στη θάλασσα, στη στεριά, ε, είχε αρχίσει να γίνεται το γνωστό πάρτι που κάνουν οι στριπλώοι, να πετάνε νερά. Με το που πάει ο Κωνσταντίνος να βγει από το σκάφος, τρέχει η αδερφή του η Σοφία με ένα λάστιχο και τον καταβρέχει όλον με νερά. Λε, λοιπόν, να πούμε ότι τους αγώνες παρακολουθούσε σύσσωμη βασιλική οικογένεια μαζί με τις κυρίες επί των τιμών που κατέγραφαν σε βιβλίο, κάθε, σε ένα ειδικό ημερολόγιο, τι γινόταν κάθε μέρα στη διοργάνωση. Λοιπόν, ο Κωνσταντίνος μουσκεμά από τα νερά βγαίνει έξω και η βασίλισσα η Φρυδερίκη που φορούσε μια ωραιότατη τουαλέτα όπως γράφουν οι εφημερίδες της εποχής δεν δίστασε να πέσει επάνω του και να τον αγκαλιάσει χωρίς να σκεφτεί ότι η τουαλέτα της θα γινόταν μέσα στα νερά. Δηλαδή το βασιλικό πρωτόκολλο καταργήθηκε εκείνη την ημέρα. Το ημερολόγιο έγραφε 7 Σεπτεμβρίου 1960. Τα ραδιόφωνα στην Ελλάδα σταμάτησαν για να βγάλουν έκτακτη είδηση αυτό το τόσο σπουδαίο μετάλλιο που πήρε η χώρα μας, που είχε πάρα πάρα πολλά χρόνια να λάβει ε, χρυσό μετάλλιο σε Ολυμπιακούς Αγώνες. Λοιπόν, από εκεί και πέρα, όταν γύρισαν στην Ελλάδα, στήθηκε ένα μεγάλο πανηγύρι. Υπήρχαν ε, αυτοκίνητα που τους παρέλαβαν με... 17 σημαίες όσο και ο αριθμός των Ολυμπιακών Αγώνων. 
πήγαν κατέθεσαν στεφάνι στο μνημείο του αγνός του στρατιώτη και όπως μου έχουν δηλώσει η Εσκιτζόγλου και Ζαΐμις, εκεί καταλάβαμε τι κάναμε. Ο Κωνσταντίνος συνέχισε να κάνει στιοπλοεία και μετά τους Ολυμπιακούς, ακόμα και όταν έφυγε από την Ελλάδα. Το 1972 έπαιρνε μέρος σε έναν αγώνα στο εξωτερικό και ξαφνικά βλέπει μπροστά του έναν Έλληνα αθλητή και του λέει «Πού είναι οι άλλοι» ε, ενώντας τον Εσκιτζόγλου, τον Ζαΐμι και τους παλιούς συναθλητές του. Του λένε είναι στο φορτηγό και τρώνε φασολάδα. Τι τρώνε, φασολάδα τρώνε. Μη φύγεις, περίμενε με. Και πάει και παίρνει τη Βασίλισσα Σοφία και τον το Χουάν Κάρλος και τους παίρνει και πηγαίνουν στο φορτηγό όπου ήταν οι Έλληνε με τα πιατάκια τους και τρώγανε φασολάδα. Βλέπουν τον βασιλιά, σηκώνονται και ειδικά ο Χουάν Κάρλος ήταν και αυτός βασιλιάς. Ε, τη Σοφία να τους προσφέρουν θέση λέει ο Κωνσταντίνος λέει, μα εμείς ήρθαμε να φάμε φασολάδα. Λοιπόν, του λένε, δεν έχουμε άλλο πιάτο, εκεί τράπηκαν και πάει στον Ισκιτζόγλου και του λέει, εμείς είμαστε στις πιοπλόοι, τρώμε όλοι από το ίδιο πιάτο. Και πήρε το πιάτο του Ισκιτζόγλου και το κουτάλι και άρχισε να τρώει από το πιάτο και από το κουτάλι του Ισκιτζόγλου. Λοιπόν, ε, έχει πάρα πολλέ τέτοιε ιστορίες στις πιοπλοϊκές ο Κωνσταντίνο. Και σίγουρα από ιστιοπλοϊκής πλευράς έφυγε ευτυχισμένο γιατί τα τελευταία χρόνια της ζωής του βρισκόταν στα ελληνικά νερά, έκανε ιστιοπλοεία με ένα σκάφος ανοιχτή θαλάσσης στην Απρόεσα, έπαιρνε μέρος στους αγώνες που γίνονταν στις πέτσες. Εκεί επάνω είχε όλο το παλιό του πλήρωμα, Εσκιτζόγου, Ζαΐνι, είχε το στέλιο, τον Πόνα, το φίλο του, έτρεχε με τον Ανδρεάδη. Ε, επίσης, ήταν μέλος ε, στην Παγκόσμια Ομοσπονδία, ήταν επίτιμο μέλος στη Διεθνή Ολυμπιακή Επιτροπή. Οι άνθρωποι της Σκεπλοείας, όπως ο Στέλιος Μπόνας, μου έχουν πει ότι είχε πάρα πολύ καλό χέρι στο τιμόνι. Ήταν πολύ καλό τιμονιέρο, όπως λέμε. Ε, η Αφρόεσσα... Στο τιμόνι της Αφρόεσσας έμεινε όσο του επέτρεπε η ηλικία και η υγεία. Πριν από δύο ή τρία χρόνια περίπου έκανε τις τελευταίες του ρότες στο αγαπημένο του πέλαγος. Πάντως θα ήθελα να προσθέσω και κάτι άλλο, ότι ο Κωνσταντίνος ήταν παρόν σε όλους τους Ολυμπιακούς Αγώνες, βρισκόταν πάντα δίπλα στην ελληνική αποστολή, κοίταζε πώς να την εμψυχώσει και με τις γνωριμίες του που είχε στη Διεθνή Ολυμπιακή Επιτροπή προσπαθούσε κάθε φορά να τους κάνει τη ζωή πιο εύκολη. Αυτά είχα να πω για το αθλητικό αποτύπωμα του Κωνσταντίνου στην παγκόσμια ιστορία. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ που με καλέσατε σε αυτή τη συζήτηση. Ευχαριστώ, Σπίριντολα. And uh, I enjoyed also dinner with you in Athens uh, about three weeks ago. So it was, it, was, it was very nice to have this discussion. And thank you for the book, by the way. Thank you for the book on, on, on Constantine. Uh, Marina, you want to take it from here? Yes, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Peter Stavridianidis. Dr. Stavridianidis is a successful entrepreneur who has been active in the Hellenic American community and has held numerous leadership positions with organizations connected with Hellenic issues of the diaspora, including the genocides of Asia Minor. He is a passionate political activist and lobbyist for Hellenic and Pontian issues, and he was instrumental in the unanimous passing of the New Jersey State Resolution of 2006 urging Turkey to respect the rights and religious freedoms of the ecumenical patriarchate in Constantinople. He is past president of the Pan-Pontian Pontian Federation of the United States and Canada. And in his tenure, the first state proclamations in 2006 for the state of New York and New Jersey regarding the Asia Minor Pontian genocide. He is currently president of the scientific and cultural organization, the Hellenic Link of New Jersey, and he sits on the board of trustees of the State Theater of New Jersey and Harvest of Hope. Peter has a passion for education, teaching as a professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology, State University of New York. 
and is currently conducting research on the history of Greek Jews with Pantheon University of Greece. He is an archon of the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle and is on the Education Committee of the Metropolis of New Jersey. He is the President-elect of the Hellenic Federation of New Jersey. Peter, thank you for joining us at EMCA. It's my pleasure. I would like to start my presentation by expressing first in the first part, my personal involvement and impressions uh, directly or indirectly regarding the former king. That would be the first part. Then the second part would include certain historic incidents that I believe characterize the former king Constantine II of Greece. And in my view, and according to historical documents are part of his legacy. In 1960, I was attending at a very young age with my family, a theatrical play in Athens. One of our family friends, Mr. Caravaz, a very staunch loyalist, was in our company. And while watching the play, he was also listening through his transistor radio. You remember those? Transistor radio. The sailing competitions of the Olympic Games of Rome, although that part of the competition was taking place in Naples, as uh, Spiridula mentioned before. So the, the, the crown prince took part in, in that yacht racing, the, the driver class. <clears throat> And he was the leader of the team of Yoro Zaimis and Odyssea Seskijogu. When it was announced that Constantine had won the race, Mr. Caravaz got up and he started screaming in the middle of the play, Odiadochos, Odiadochos, Olibionikis. The play was interrupted for about 30 minutes to give the opportunity to a couple of hundred people who were in the theater to celebrate before the, the play could resume again. A year later, I auditioned for the children's choir of the chapel of the Royal Palace in Tatoi. That was the name of it. And I made it. Uh, it was a dream come true. And, and I participated with the choir for a couple of Sundays in the spring. And then we took a break for the summer. Uh, during that time, we had the opportunity to meet, to see Constantine a few times, who would always come over to greet us, spend some time with us, asking, her, asking us questions about sports, which sports do we like? And he was always very cordial and approachable. When we returned in the fall to start rehearsals again, I was disqualified because over the summer, my voice had changed. You know, puberty is relentless at times. So I was no longer qualified to con continue. Fast forward a few years later, the early 70s, find me in New York, a college student, being involved with the anti junta movement, which included individuals from different colors of the political spectrum, I would say mostly from the left, but also from the center and the right, and, and very few royalists who after 1973 disappeared and who eventually would be identified as Vasilo Kundiki. I don't have an equivalent word in English. 
Well, uh, as, as you all know, I'm sure, in the 60s, the country was still in the mode of recovering from the civil war of the 40s. And I would say the convenient but necessary need of the democratic right to go into an alliance with the far right and those that played a dark role during the occupation by aligning with the Germans. But of course, that ambiguous era of the 40s and the 50s deserves another MCA panel to discuss it sometime in the near future. So I described to you the, the first part that uh, the former King Constantine, especially as a Diabolos, as an heir to the throne, he was very likable. And, and people were ready to excuse any of his uh, trellis, any of his things that he was doing as, as a young person, especially his affair with the very well-known uh, movie star, Aliki Buyukaki. And, and, you know, speaking about martial arts, I, as, a young, as, as a young kid, that was the first time that I entertained the thought of learning martial arts, which I did later. Um, and as a matter of fact, in fact, his teacher was Megaritis. He was a very, he was the first famous martial arts instructor. And there's a couple of pictures that show Constantine doing a flying kick. And he was, he was like, it was perfection. You know, I, in the beginning, I thought that it was, um, uh, you know, it was made up. But I think he was, he was good enough to do that, those flying kings. Uh, he had golden opportunities that, unfortunately, he was not mature enough to take advantage of. The first one, I would say, in 1967, he could have avoided to inaugurate and legalize uh, the colonels of the junta. And by looking and checking the analysis of uh, historians and political analysts, we can see that if he had done that, uh, the junta wouldn't be able to politically sustain their power. It would be a matter of weeks or maybe months before they would collapse. However, he did not do that. And then of course, what followed was that ill-organized coup d'etat, which was a fiasco, it was a disaster. The other golden opportunity that he had that he could have done is to resign from his position after his failed coup d'etat and refuse to receive any allowance, which he continued receiving until 1973. These were opportunities that would have given a different image to the people who until that time, until 1967, they, most of the, uh, most of the population Greeks thought the world of him. And also uh, his, uh, uh, his wife, uh, Anna, Marie, Anna Maria, she was very likable by the people. So Constantine, had these golden opportunities, even after he could have been a leader in the anti-Huda movement, he would have been received as a hero in 1974. And Karaman Manlis could, couldn't do anything to prevent, to prevent this from happening. So I, I'm not speaking like this because I am for the monarchy. I just want to 
don't want to give any wrong impressions at this point. It has been determined once and for all that we are not going to have monarchy now or in the near future, or in the far future. However, I do like his family. I, I saw how respectful they were for the Hellenic Republic. I see uh, the, all the philanthropic events that they hold and how close they are to the Hellenic spirit. I really like, uh, you want to call him Prince, I really like, like Nikolaos. Uh, I think he lives in, in, in Greece permanently. And I think this family, the Glicksburg family, the family of former King Constantine, can play a significant role, whether it be philanthropic or political or social. I think they can play uh, a significant role, and I would support that. So at this point, I would like to complete my uh, presentation for this part, and then we'll continue with a panel discussion at one point. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Peter. If, if, if we were judged uh, in many cases by what we did in our youth, I think, I think we would all have problems. Everybody who's sitting here in, I wanted in, to, a, in a panel today. I wanted to tell sure. you that the word in English that you were searching for would be, would be Monaco Pontes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I wanted, I wanted to add one other thing. You said that the, um, the active people against the junta were mostly from the left. I wrote more against the junta than any journalist in the world, I think, in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications. And I don't think many people would consider me a leftist. <laughs> I think, I think, true, uh, true. I think many, many people who, who, who prize democracy were against the junta, just that uh, they are against uh, communist totalitarianism. Nick, I think I was careful, but no, this is, I, I accept well, that, you're very correct. I was very careful to say, at that particular era in New York, in the, from the student body that was involved with this, as a matter of from, uh, my friend, uh, and, uh, I'm sure you know, Antonio Diamataris, uh, we happened to be students at the time, and we belong to that group of students. And the former minister, uh, PASOK minister, uh, Professor Dr. Theodore Stathis, he was the president. And I was actually the vice president of the youth at the time. So I could only judge by that group of people, as I mentioned, that most were from the left, and some of us were from the center and the right. Uh, we, we, one, we, will, we, will, we will get into that in a second, Peter, when okay. we go to the, to the open discussion. Um, I, I will say that most of the people are not leftists, but that's a separate issue. That's a separate issue. Uh, okay. we'll, get into that, we'll get into that a little bit later. Our next panelist is uh, Dimitri Filios, uh, a journalist and public relations consultant. Dimitri Filios was born and raised in Athens. Both his parents descended from Arcadia. He studied economics at the London School of Economics in England and the New School uh, University in New York. In his capacity as a journalist, Dimitri served as a reporter, community affairs editor, and finally a chief uh, editor uh, of the pro Ni, the Hellenic American Daily. He was a contributing writer, correspondent for various publications in Alas that many of us know about. He served, he also served as a writer and a managing editor for the uh, Hellenic Times. And for 17 years, he was the radio correspondent in New York for ERT. He has been with the Hellenic uh, public radio uh, station, Cosmos FM, since 2002. And since 2015, uh, he is the producer of the weekly radio magazine, Sunday edition, along with Panos Satsoglu. Dimitri is also a marketing and public relations consultant with various corporations here and abroad. He is a true believer in the immortal and timeless values of Hellenism, 
participates as a volunteer in many community organizations, and he has been the president of Yeros Tumoria, the Arcadian Association in New York, and the Pan-Arcadian Federation of America. Currently, he is the elected general secretary of the Hellenic Congress of America, and is also a member of the Athenian Society of New York. He stands for the unity, for the unity, um, Whoa, I guess, uh, listen, it doesn't matter. He stands, he stands for the unity of alienists all over the world. He is the best. And as a matter of fact, I was on his radio program a little bit earlier today to describe this particular program. Welcome, Dimitri, and thank you for being with Emka today. Thank you, Lou. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone here and in Greece. Uh, Thank you for the invitation uh, for this uh, uh, really distinguished panel. Uh, King Constantine II uh, was a tragic figure, the last king of the Hellenes, who has actually reigned for only three years as uh, he uh, was uh, forced to flee the country in uh, uh, December 1967, after the failed counter coup against the military junta, then ruling Greece, after the coup d'etat of April 21, 1967. I met him in the early 90s, uh, introduced by the late Archbishop Iacobos. I had the opportunity to interview him at length uh, here uh, uh, at uh, the Plaza Hotel, actually. Uh, and uh, also I had the opportunity to meet him twice privately, once here in New York and once in uh, Athens, uh, uh, Greece. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the latter uh, one uh, immediately after the triumphant uh, 2004 Athens Olympic Games. Even though I am a strong believer in democracy and uh, I am an opponent of the monarchy, uh, including constitutional monarchy, I do believe that uh, despite his mistakes, uh, both in 1967, uh, that uh, has created a political and constitutional crisis in Greece, uh, over his clash with uh, the elected uh, uh, then Prime Minister Georgios Papandreou, which he openly admitted, not only to me, but also in uh, various interviews and public pronouncements, including his interviews with uh, Georgos Malouchos, uh, who wrote his autobiographical book. Uh, later in life, uh, he discussed it uh, personally and privately with George Papandreou, the former foreign minister uh, of Greece and prime minister later, uh, uh, the grandson and uh, namesake of Georgios Papandreou. He, I can say that uh, he loved Greece. He loved everything Hellenic including the immortal Hellenic culture and civilization. And he took pains to educate his five children in the Greek uh, pedia, Hellenic glossa, and politismo. He reminded me the Socrates apothegm, Hellenes are the ones who partake in Hellenic pedia. And he said that in perfect, ancient Greek. He detested the name Glicksburg, as uh, Nick uh, mentioned. And uh, I would like uh, to say that this name, upon research, I found out that it was given to the royal family by uh, the uh, anti-royalist organization, Demokratiki Amina, in uh, 1917 when Eleftherios Venizelos, during the First World War, 
left uh, Athens and um, went to Thessaloniki to form a separate uh, government, uh, which wanted to initiate Greece's entrance into the war on the side of the Entente allies, England and France, against Germany, of course. Uh, his uh, namesake, uh, grand, uh, great uncle, King uh, Constantine I, of course, uh, was wanted Greece to remain neutral, but um, uh, he was rooted openly for uh, uh, Germany since uh, his wife Sophia was uh, the sister of uh, Germany's uh, Kaiser or uh, Emperor. It was the first civil unrest, ethnicos de Hasmos, national split, uh, which um, uh, of course marked in a very dark uh, uh, shadow uh, Greek, uh, modern Greek history. Um, during his reign, of course, as uh, Panos Stavrianidis said, he was not mature and he was not strong enough to take charge of the situation and ignore his royal uh, court uh, advisors like uh, uh, Ablarchis uh, uh, Levidis, and, um, who was the director of the royal court, and um, uh, his uh, personal advisor, uh, Major Arnautis, and others who uh, led him uh, to take the wrong decision uh, to uh, clash with the elected Prime Minister Georgios Papandreou. Later, on April 21st, 1967, he had his last good chance to take action against the Huda and uh, 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 lead the democratic opposition. Instead, uh, he oversaw the swearing in ceremony of the Huda cabinet, uh, which he later tried uh, to overthrow with a failed December 13th uh, counter coup. The counter coup was not bloodless, unfortunately, uh, at least 100 uh, uh, people, both in the Air Force and the Army, died during two separate classes outside of air bases that had been encircled by tanks and uh, other forces uh, loyal to the junta. Of course, uh, some people say that uh, he could um, uh, direct the Air Force, which was loyal to him, uh, to even bomb army bases. But this would have been a civil war. And he has told me that he flatly ruled it out. I do believe that uh, this was uh, uh, a decision that, um, uh, 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 of course, uh, saved many lives. But uh, again, he could have his chance back in April 1967. As uh, a human being, he was uh, polite, very educated, and pleasant. And um, uh, uh, I believe that um, uh, really his um, uh, uh, paradigm in the last uh, years uh, of his life, when he returned to Greece, showed uh, that uh, besides politics, uh, he remained uh, uh, true to uh, his uh, Hellenic uh, uh, upbringing and uh, to uh, everything Hellenic. And um, I do believe that, uh, as I said, that the monarchy has no future in Greece. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons is not only Constantinus, but also the tainted history of the monarchy, which uh, uh, the Hellenic people saw as a foreign body for most of the reign of the seven uh, kings that uh, Lou referred to, giving us a brief uh, uh, 
historical outline in the beginning of uh, uh, today's panel. Uh, uh, finally, um, uh, I would say that um, his, uh, he was a class act and his uh, uh, funeral for uh, which he left uh, detailed instructions to uh, uh, his family, uh, Anna Maria and uh, uh, his children, especially Pavlos, the uh, oldest um, uh, son, uh, showed that uh, he wanted uh, to uh, leave uh, this earth um, um, not as uh, a royal, but uh, as the former king of the Hellenes. And he insisted on that, Vasilevs ton Hellenon, or he Vasilevs is Elados. Uh, and that is uh, a reference to the entire Hellenism and to uh, Apodimos Hellenismos, the Hellenic diaspora, um, to which he has traveled extensively and he has met with uh, many people of all political uh, uh, walks of life and different uh, ideologies. And um, uh, I wanted to be this as a, a memorial uh, to uh, uh, not only to him, but also to uh, his um, love for Greece and everything Hellenic. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri Marina. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas Alexiou. Nicholas was born in Volos, Greece, where he studied economics. He has received a Master's of Arts degree in sociology from Queens College, City University of New York, a PhD in sociology from the Graduate Center, City University of New York. He has taught at the Department of Sociology at Queens College, City University of New York since 1990 and he has received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching. His fields of interest are social and political sociology, ethnic studies, and research. He has established the first archive library museum for the Greeks of New York, and he is the director of, the research, of research for the Hellenic American Project at, at Queens College. He is a contemporary poet and the author of six books of poetry, Many of his poems have been published in Greek and American journals and anthologies. He is a member of the Greek Authors Association of Greece and the Greek American Writers Guild Association of New York. He is the director of the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance. Thank you, Nico, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for uh, this nice introduction. You said, you, said, you said too much, I guess. And um, I would like to, uh, to thank you all um, I'm really very happy to be um, among uh, this distinguished guest in a very difficult uh, time for Greece again, uh, when uh, Greece is uh, mourning, you know, um, the uh, the deaths of so many people, especially the young people, and of course I would like to protest once more against the Greek government uh, at this time, uh, attacking a peaceful. Uh, uh, demonstrators uh, today in Athens and other cities uh, in support of, uh, of the victims, of the, of the dead. Uh, usually uh, the last person uh, who talks in a panel after all these nice uh, presentations has uh, very little uh, to, to, to say, but uh, I will try to come to, to, to the standards of, of the panel and I will let, uh, since we, you all uh, had a, a personal uh, uh, theme, uh, I, I, I said at the end of my presentation, um, I have many doubts about many things that um, we heard today, and I would like uh, to start the, <coughs> the PowerPoint. Uh, and uh, and said that, that um, uh, uh, King. Uh, Constantine, he follow he follow the the, the the typical route that all his uh, predecessors had, uh, all the kings of Greeks of, of Greece, uh, they they created uh, awful situations for, for, for the country. In 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 modern um, 
the monarchy overall uh, serve the interest uh, of their families and themselves and not of the people. I'll give some examples. Τα νομβριανά του 16, το σχίσμα όπου είπε και ο Φίλης το 20, the polarization we saw in 16, in 46, and of course in 65 with the apostasia that led to the junta. The diversion uh, from the constitution in 1936 by supporting uh, Metaxa, and this is, uh, uh, I would like to, to add a, 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 another term, since uh, you very well put uh, the, the term of the um, um, monarcho juntist, who had the, the monarcho fascists uh, in one of his, uh, of his uh, predecessors, in, monor in monarcho fascists. Ναι, από τους yeah. μοναρχοφασίστες, τους βασιλοχουντικούς. Yeah. Ε, ήταν η συνέχεια α, αυτών των καταστάσεων. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the difference to the unity of the nation from 16 to the 40 and 49 to 67. Uh, and of course, uh, the kings were uh, responsible to their part to the largest national catastrophe, the catastrophe, the catastrophe of Zmirna in 1922. Uh, the next panel uh, will talk more specific about things that you already mentioned, but I would like to refresh our, our, our memories that the former king of Greece saw in the first government of Hunda under the, the, the colonels. Uh, historical evidence shows that the day after the coup, the, the colonels went to the palace unarmed. He could have arrested them, uh, but he did not, as, uh, as, as Panos uh, uh, mentioned it. It was easy. We have more evidence of that from the archives and, and, um, and written documents, not just what people say. Uh, uh, the Huda had no control at, at the moment and it was easy with a single blow, as Patakos himself uh, said. Um, of course, uh, we have evidence that they had a, uh, a plan B to escape, right? So they knew that if the king had Uh, the guards to do something, um, they, they were out, but he did not. In the next panel, we see another um, uh, uh, very graphic issue that he, he put in his autobiography, that um, although he was against the junta, uh, he, he didn't mind to take a picture with them uh, and, and swear at them, of course. And uh, uh, this is uh, really... Um, something to the extreme, uh, he called, uh, he asked for the picture because um, he wanted to show uh, uh, that he resisted the junta, but not uh, by not smiling. Uh, this is uh, what he said and what he wrote in his autobiography. And this is the famous uh, picture that his unsmiling disposition in the photo, uh, of course, did not stop him from celebrating a, a month later Easter, his name day, and even the birth of his son with the colonels. There are many pictures and many documents and, um, uh, and reels celebrating with the Junta people uh, just a month after uh, this, uh, this picture. In the next uh, 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 slide, we see the infamous counter movement uh, that uh, all, of, all of you said it was a fiasco, very poorly organized and is not uh, certain at all that he really wanted to, to do so. Uh, of course, uh, everybody knew about this, uh, at, at least uh, the colonels knew, although he was uh, being advised by President Johnson uh, not to wage uh, the counter movement. Uh, he, he didn't uh, listen to any, anyone. And of course, he fled um, uh, for Rome and later for, for, for uh, London. He himself, admitted many times that this attempt was a complete failure. In the next uh, slide, uh, we'll, make, we'll make some, uh, um, because one of his uh, excuses that he uses all the time and he wrote about that uh, he didn't do much, not because he was incompetent, but he didn't uh, want uh, um, to create a civil war or a bloodshed, but he did, but don't do in anything. Um, especially when people were uh, in concentration camps in Macronis and Yaro. Of course, it started before him, but it lasted uh, several years uh, while he was there. Uh, this is an example, Yaros, uh, from uh, 
465 that that he he was there until um, uh, the 70s when he he left so he continued during his uh, his tenure so this excuse that um, he, uh, he didn't want to uh, provoke or lead uh, Greece to um, um, another um, uh, schism uh, or polarization uh, it is another lie or another uh, uh, naive analysis by, by him in the next uh, slide just follow the money as uh, Pano said he continue uh, the moment he left uh, Greece he continued accepting the money that the Hunda gave him and not only that the Hunda goes so uh, in order to, to express uh, their, their gr uh, gratitude uh, uh, to him, uh, they gave him more money. They sent him his his car, and um, immediately he received uh, twenty five thousand dollars for the for the first uh, you know to begin with. Uh, so I don't know why uh, uh, my dear friend Filio said that he he liked everything that, that was Hellenic. Uh, yes, he liked everything that was Hellenic, especially the money of Greece. He he really enjoyed the money of Greece. Um, and we see that also in the next panel. Not only he received money uh, throughout the Hunda, the seven years of, of Hunda, but um, in 1991, uh, Prime Minister uh, Kostadir Mitsotakis, the father of the present uh, uh, Prime Minister Kyriakos, they made an agreement and they let uh, the family uh, steal or, or take uh, from the the, the Tatoi uh, uh, um, premises, nine containers. Of course, uh, those containers, uh, what the, uh, the valuables, they were sold to various auctions um, in, in later years. Marquezinis himself, of all people, he expressed that the sale of these belongings was illegal as they were cultural heritage of the Hellenic Republic. So once more, the Hellenic Republic uh, was uh, um, um, robbed. Uh, it was... Uh, a serious uh, uh, contradiction and uh, uprising uh, with the decision of uh, uh, the Mitsotakis government of that time and the new democracy. Uh, and it's more in the next slide that in 2002, the, because he went to the uh, European courts, uh, the former king, and he asked for uh, 500 million dollars, I mean uh, euros, uh, as um, uh, reparations. Uh, of course, uh, the European uh, uh, courts, uh, they decided that he should get 11 million. And uh, he did. Um, the money that Greece had to pay to the family and, and to him um, was taken out from uh, the budget for uh, natural uh, disasters. And then he claimed uh, that he will form, and he did, uh, in an offshore uh, uh, region to, uh, into Liechtenstein. He created a non-profit organization for this purpose. Uh, so far, we have no evidence that he gave uh, the money back to Greece uh, to some kind of thing. So uh, when Pano said that uh, the philanthropic thing, I was very surprised because we haven't seen anything philanthropic yet or returning the money um, to the rightful uh, owner, which is the Greek uh, people. Uh, in the next uh, panel, uh, of course, the fiasco, you all cover it, and uh, it is uh, clear that, that, of course, um, the first vote uh, in um, during the junta was not accepted by anyone, but the second vote that was actually the first democratic <laughs> uh, vote uh, for Greece, uh, uh, the people you know, spoken and um, the overwhelming majority, uh, they, they, they supported uh, um, uh, not to have a monarchy. And that's why I cannot understand the popularity that uh, some of you mentioned today. I, I don't know why you, you keep saying he was popular. I don't think so he was popular. And uh, the years of his uh, tenure, it was uh, the years of mass immigration from Greece, uh, not only to the States, but the new immigration that happened to Germany, to Belgium, uh, and then other uh, Northern uh, European countries, Canada and Australia also. So uh, uh, his, his popularity uh, is not very visible to me or, or understood. 
uh, in the next panel, to 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 remind us a, a, a very popular uh, um, um, uh, schizo that uh, of that day, it was by Orestes Ornakis, nineteen seventy four. Uh, the Ochi, when uh, the people voted uh, against the monarchy. And uh, many analysts, they, they, they have concluded that the only positive outcome of, of, the, of, of, the, of the tenure of the former king, which was uh, not just three years, uh, Dimitri was three years and nine months, was that he contributed because of his uh, uh, politics and, and, uh, and positions he took to the end of the anachronistic institution of monarchy in Greece. Uh, so I think um, I will stop here for uh, the first part of our presentation. <laughs> in, 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 it's interesting that you ended with a, with, with with that last uh, cartoon. Let's say, but yeah, I, it, I will. It was very popular at the time. Uh, you know, was, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of things were popular, but let, you know, I'm not. I'm not yeah. for monarchs to begin with being raised in America. But I have to say a couple of things. You know, both to you and um, and Pano and other people. I mean, don't forget, you know, when we talk about him taking the money from Greece and all the rest of that, you know, he was, he was, uh, you know, it was abolished in 1973. So from the, from the point of view of him not being there, he was entitled, he was entitled to the money by law until, until the, uh, the monarchy was in fact abolished. Not only that, in, uh, in uh, that particular vote, the first vote, and then finally the second vote, mm -hmm. don't forget, he was not allowed to come in and in fact, and in fact, do any type of campaign to support the um, monarchy. Uh, Louis, excuse me to interrupt. It was his choice because, according to the uh, Greek constitution, he had to provide the last name, and he refused to do that. And yeah, that but the reason the reason why he didn't provide the last name, we got to be fair, you go, we got to yeah. be fair. The yeah. reason why he didn't pr provide the last name is because, as he indicated, okay, that his last name, his last it's name his is not is not hold it is not the region that he came from, okay, not the place that he came from. In yeah. fact, the kings of that of the of the Denmark, etc., yeah. did not have last names. I'm not I'm not making any excuses for for, for the scenario, but we have to be we have to be in this in because, this dialogue in this dialogue we have to be fair. We have yes. to be fair. Yes, but uh, I wanted, in, in, in I wanted to, to that, say something. Yeah, please, I wanted go ahead. to say something please, in please, the, please. because uh, Professor Alivizatos, Nikos Alivizatos, who yes. was uh, the legal counsel of the Hellenic Republic in the uh, High Court uh, of Europe for Human Rights against uh, former King Constantine, has told me in an interview here at Cosmos FM uh, uh, five weeks uh, ago after the passing of Constantine that um, um, uh, he was asked specifically by the legal uh, uh, Council of Greece, Nomikos Symbolio to Kratos, to choose a name, and he was given uh, a choice, uh, Constantinos Pavlou, uh, a, a name which means Constantine of Pavlos. Uh, he flatly ruled it out. Uh, so there was an attempt to get a name. Afterwards, he came back to Greece uh, with a, a Danish passport as a, a member of the royal family of uh, Denmark, which has uh, the monarchy. And uh, uh, I remind you that um, uh, Anna Maria is from Denmark and also his uh, 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 grandfather, uh, great grandfather, uh, George, was uh, uh, Georgios, the first from uh, um, uh, Denmark the second born prince of Denmark. Anyway, uh, in accordance with the Schengen Treaty, Greece was uh, 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 had no choice but to admit him uh, as a, a, a member of a European nation country, a EU, EU country, Denmark. And uh, again, during his meeting with uh, Georgios Papandreou, George Papandreou, uh, they offered him to choose a name, to go to the Lixiarchio uh, and take uh, a name. So in that respect, I believe 
Nikos, Nikos Alexiou, uh, uh, is right. Well, Dimitri, Dimitri, hold on a second, hold on a second. They passed a special law. They passed a special law in 1994, okay, that said that he has to ha- that he has to have a surname. He has has to have a surname. Now, they could have they could have done something else. Obviously, he didn't have a surname. That's obvious, and that's what he he basically said. Now, to offer him the name, the surname of his father, and all the rest of that, I I, I don't know if that's kosher. To be honest with you, it, in my opinion, again, I'm not a royalist or anything, but but that was kind of a nasty thing for Andreas to do to pass a special law that required him to have a surname or to pick a surname, and then and then effectively taking away his citizenship, his his passport, and all the rest of that, forcing him basically forcing him basically to get a Danish passport to come into Greece. That's, his that's choice. It. it was his choice. Like uh, we are all, all equal uh, uh, under the constitution, so he he he's no exception. I would like to tell you that the former Nea uh, Demokratia government of Greece had uh, issued a red flag for him not to visit Greece. And uh, when his, uh, uh, because you mentioned Andreas Papandreou. Uh, yes, I did. When, his, uh, when uh, by the government of Greece, Konstantinos Karamalis uh, in uh, 1975. And uh, that it was published uh, in the government gazette, and also in um, back uh, in uh, um, uh, when his um, uh, mother passed away, Frideriki, uh, uh, the Rallis administration uh, le- uh, gave him permission and the other members of the royal family to visit this just for 12 hours, not even to stay overnight uh, for the funeral of Frideriki under heavy security in Tatoi at uh, the year 1981, a few months prior to the election of 1981, when uh, Andreas Papandreou was first elected. Uh, I want to say something, if I may, because I, well, I want to stand firm on a couple of things that I mentioned this way to make sure that it wasn't misunderstood. Uh, definitely, and we, we can, I mean, I lived those years there. So uh, one way of conducting research, of course, I was very young, is to observe, to be an observer. So that's part of, you know, becoming a, a, a researcher. But also as a kid, I could attest that, so let's say in elementary school and later in the, the first couple of years in high school, all the kids thought the world of Constantine. And these are the kids that 15, 20 years later would be the ones to vote for the referendum. If he had played his cards right, he could have, he could have been the king today. He could have been the king of those years. And we see many other progressive European countries that do, they do have a monarchy. Of course, the monarchy doesn't play any significant role. But when it comes to monarchy, although I'm not a monarchist at this time, I wouldn't have done anything to prevent it, provided that it was the democracy was uh, duly respected, uh, let me use the word thoracismeni, which is 100% thoracismeni, the third democracy in Greece, if we want to call that the, 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 the third democracy, and that's what it is. So if it wasn't for his lack of leadership, and, and I'm not saying that most of historians can attest to that, uh, we would still have monarchy today, and everybody uh, would be happy. It would be a progressive monarchy. It would be a different type of monarchy. His mistake was that he succumbed to the ill advice to his mother and to his uh, to his entourage, to his advisors. He was young, but you know, history punishes. History takes revenge, doesn't give you excuses that you were too young or whatever. Yes, he was too young and inexperienced, 
but well, he was popular at listen, the time. Peter, well, we, his we, father was we, not that popular. We, his yeah. fa- his mother definitely, but uh, Constantine as a, as an heir to the throne, he was very popular. Yes, please. Did you want to say? Yeah. Well, well, I, w- I was going to say. Listen, we all we all make mistakes, and they did vote him out in uh, in 1973. Don't forget the mood at the time in the nation was completely different. Okay, not not only not only were were they against the king, but they were also against the United States of America. Okay, because they felt in many cases the U.S. the U.S. supported the junta. Don't forget that there was an issue and a split within our society itself, where they felt the Hellenic Americans actually were supporting the junta. And, and also they supported certain things. So there was a lot of things going on. It wasn't all about the king. It wasn't all Look, about the king. Let me tell you something. If those mistakes had not been made, we probably wouldn't have the Cyprus situation. Probably- We're not, uh, we're not, disa- we're not, we're not disagreeing, but the, but the Cyprus situation, as we all know, okay, because it also ties in the United States of America. It also ties in Russian influence within the Eastern Mediterranean. And what was happening with well, with Makarios and and uh, and that whole scene, uh, etc. There's a lot of complicated little little pieces. And, and but, but, he was, but the monarchy was rejected in 1973. Okay, at at some point you figure <clears throat> people people would would come to grips with certain things, and they would say, okay, the monarchy is is completed. Someone wants to visit a country that they that they feel is their country. Okay, they self-identify as being Hellenes. Okay, and we take their passports and things like that, and we pass special laws that say you can't do certain things. And if you don't give me a surname, I'm going to take away your passport, forcing you to come with a foreign passport. That's a little nasty. I could be well, wrong. Okay. That to me is a no, little nasty. One thing, one thing. In 1973, the monarchy was arbitrarily rejected, not by the people. It was rejected by the junta. I think... The monarchy that was the first justly, time. There was a second vote. There was a second vote. But, but it was justly, it was justly rejected in the referendum of 1974. And if you take under consideration the mood of the people, that he still got 30 percent, I think it's incredible. I think it's it's a well, tremendous look, look number. At, I like I like you actually. Know, at that I like, point, I would never person. vote for him. Listen, if I were, I, like, in, I, I lived in, I lived in, in in the U.S. But if I were in Greece, as I remember back in the early sixties, that I thought the world of him, I would have voted against the monarchy. So this is the mood of the of the people in nineteen seventy four, and he still got thirty almost thirty percent. That's well, well, incredible. I like, I like he got Nico's, a good PR. That doesn't mean anything that he was wanted. I like I like Nico's map. Nico, I like your map by the way, where you had the vote. Because what was interesting to me, even though I'm not for monarchies, yeah. what was interesting to me is La Cognia was was behind was behind the king 100 percent. Fifty, I think, fifty four percent in La Cognia. And and, and the whole Peloponnesus was actually mixed. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Nick. I want to say that uh, that thirty percent um, he got without being able to um, appear or speak. And exactly. I mean, we want to be so you fair. You can't call He's someone right. who got 30% without ever appearing or speaking in the country. Uh, yeah, he, 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 he was not popular, uh, Nico. I mean, uh, I think you, you can say that he didn't have the, the majority support of the country. Absolutely. But uh, that he didn't have uh, the support of uh, a large section of the uh, population, I think... Uh, yeah. The, the numbers uh, tell the theory. I want to say one other thing that I thought was unfortunate. When Harilaus uh, Florakis died, the head of the Communist Party, who was a leader of the uh, uh, of the Communist insurrection from 1946-49, and uh, uh, was responsible for the deaths of many innocent people, later became uh, head of the uh, Greek Communist Party, when and his a party which never got more than fifteen percent of the vote in Greece. Um, when he died, the president of Greece, the prime minister of Greece, uh, the leaders of all the major parties in Greece attended his funeral. When Constantine died, only one uh, former president 
Andoni Samaraj, a former prime minister, attended the funeral. Uh, I think uh, that uh, 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 indicates that uh, perhaps uh, Greeks do not always uh, uh, view their history in um, objective terms. Very <laughs> well, you know, we, we more than alluded to that, the fact that uh, when when they had the funeral, they rejected completely a state funeral, which was which was to a certain degree nasty, just like I thought, even though, again, I'm not for kings or anything. It was, a right, thought, it was a right decision. Really. Well, I don't know. I thought the law, the law of 94, you know, and there's Papandreos, again, nasty stuff. He wasn't a king anymore. He wasn't a king anymore. Let the people live. Now, Nico, you talked about political families, okay? You talked about political families, the king, the king's family, and all the rest of that. How about the political families in Greece that rule Greece today? The five or six or seven families that have ruled there for decades and decades and decades, Nico. But at least I, I have the right as a Greek citizen to vote. So uh, one was um, imposed because uh, uh, the history of the kings in Greece was imposed, right, by, by the great powers uh, after the liberation. Absolutely, so, absolutely. I, I wish they, they, made, they made King Kolokontroni, for example, right, but uh, no, it was, uh, so it is a history of imposition and, and, uh, and uh, 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 you know, the, all this um, situation um, uh, uh, of, of, of colonized country, because we, we were a colony and we still are to some extent, but still, Florakis and others, since you mentioned Floraki, they were elected, de democratically elected. So uh, 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 kingdom and kings and queens are not elected, they're imposed. No, no, we understand that, Nico, but, but we, we said that he was elected out of the office in, uh, in, let's say, two votes, in 73, obviously, and in 74, that was indicated by, by Peter, okay? Why can't someone, you know, live and be a human being and be accepted as being Hellene? Why, why do they keep ma making nasty references to his last name and like he's a foreigner, when in fact you've had generations of his family be in Elas, they're just as Hellenic as anyone. Why can't we accept that? Forget about kings for a second. Why can't we accept that? Why can't we have where people self-identify as being Hellenes, why can't we accept for them to be Hellenes? Why can't we do that? We have so many uh, panelists in Emka uh, about, <laughs> about the vote now. We can't even vote as Greeks abroad. So, uh, yeah, it, it's always complicated with the Greek state. <laughs> <laughs> I want to point out that uh, Andres Papandreou's uh, 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 grandfather was uh, Polish. Does that mean that we call him a foreigner? I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. Nico, let's also talk about kings. Let's talk about the Papandre, okay, for example. Grandfather, father, son, etc. They become prime ministers. Mitsotaki is the same story. Yeah. Okay, so so these are like these are like like kings. Okay, now you say okay, there's a democratic vote. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But also, who who has analyzed what is the budget of the presidency as uh, the budget of the uh, of of the. Uh, king of, of Greece. I don't think we spend less money now because we, we have no king. Again, I say I'm not a monarchist. I would not vote for a monarchy for, uh, for the people who, who uh, created democracy. But um, uh, it's, um, you know, I don't think um, uh, the um, some of the uh, uh, accusations uh, and the personal accusations um, are justified, and uh, I think uh, uh, as they certainly deserve to, to uh, um, uh, and they, even international law, to call themselves Greeks and to be recognized as Greeks. We we sell citizenship for five hundred thousand. That's uh, right. That's right. Uh, well, I'm I'm in total agreement with that. We have the so-called golden visas. You know, people just buy a property, they get residency, etc., and they can do whatever they want. Meanwhile, a family that has been there X amount of years, forget about the fact that they're not kings anymore or monarchies, and we don't believe in it. At least I don't. But um, they all have a last name, Lou. Elaf, do put the last name. Okay, you know. You one know. more thing. One more thing. One more thing. One more thing for whatever that means. He was the last crown king that was of the Orthodox faith. 
or whatever that means. She was the last one of the Orthodox faith. So let's also keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, Spiridola, δεν έχει μιλήσει, δεν έχει μιλήσει για το θέμα. But ξέρω εγώ ότι είσαι εσύ από τη Μάνη. Και όπω βλέπω το χάρτη που είχε ο, που είχε ο, ο Νίκο, το χάρτη λέει ότι οι Μανιάτε και οι Σπαρτιάτε, etc., Λακόνιαντ, ψηφίσανε για το Βασιλιά. Πέστε μα λίγο για το θέμα αυτό. Θέλω να σας πω μια ιστορία πάνω σε αυτό. Όταν είχε πει ο Κωνσταντίνος για να πάρει τα πράγματά του που δεν τον δέχονταν στην Ελλάδα, ήταν με σκάφος και προσπάθησε να βγει κάτω στο γήθιο. Ε, τότε είχε πάει το λιμενικό και, προσπα... και θέλησε να μην τον αφήσει να επιβινά που βιβαστεί στο γήθιο. Αμέσως τρέξαν όλοι κάτοικοι του γηθίου. Εκεί είχε κάποια μαγαζιά που πουλαγαν ε, φρούτα, καρπούζια, πεπόνια κλπ. Και αρχίσανε τους λιμενικούς με τα πεπόνια και τα καρπούζια με αποτέλεσμα οι λιμενικοί να τραπούν σε φυγή και ο Κωνσταντίνος να κατέβει στο γήθιο. Ήταν το μόνο μέρος που κατέβηκε τότε που δεν γινόταν ακόμα δεκτός στην Ελλάδα. Let me, let me mention one, one other thing. And that's in spite of the fact okay, that the Maniatas had actually a war a war with the uh, with King Otto. And as a matter of fact, the Maniatas won the war against King Otto's uh, Bavarian troops. Mm-hmm. And uh, the funny thing in Mani was always that when they ransomed the troops, that when they ransomed their donkeys, that the donkeys got a higher price than the Bavarian troops. I thought that would be, a, you know, a nice scenario to mention. And in spite of that, they voted later for the King of Greece. <laughs> later though, later though, Otto, <laughs> got the Maniates and Cretans yes. uh, of course. in his court. Uh, of course. And uh, he made p- peace with them. Of course, the Maniates won that war. And they were fiercely anti-royalist and fiercely against anything uh, uh, reminding central power. And they said, then Plironame Forus Metus Turkus, a Plironame Forus Tora. Αυτό έχει μια ωραία ιστορία σε αυτό. Δεν ξέρω αν τη γνωρίζετε. Επιόθωνος είχαν στείλει ένα απόσπασμα με εύζονες στη Μάνη προκειμένου να τους αποπλήσουν και να ζητήσουν τους φόρους. Οι Μανιάτες τότε ήταν λίγο σε άγρια κατάσταση. Τους συνέλαβαν και τους πούλησαν σκλάβους στην Μπαρμπαριά. Ύστερα από αρκετά χρόνια κάποιος κατάφερε και απέδρασε και πήγε και είπε πώς έγινε η κατάσταση. Τότε ο βασιλιάς ο Γιώργος ο Άλφα ε, σκέφτηκε να πάει κάτω στη Μάνη και να τους, κάνει, να τους φέρει πιο κοντά. Κατέβηκε σε ένα μέρος που ήταν πολύ φτωχό, οι άνθρωποι είχαν μόνο ελιές γιατί είναι μια γη άγωνη ε, και εκεί τους πρότεινε να πάνε όλοι στα σώματα ασφαλεία. Δηλαδή στο στρατό, στην αεροπορία, στην αστυνομία και από τότε όλοι οι μανιάτε έγιναν βασιλικοί. Κύριε Δούνα, μήπω υπάρχει κάποιο, γιατί δεν το το γνωρίζω αυτό, αν υπάρχει κάποιο επίσημο έγγραφο κάπου, αν πήρε θέση ο Κωνσταντίνο για το μεγάλο σεξουαλικό σκάνδαλο που έγινε με την πεκατόρο στην ιστιοπλοεία και όλα τα σκάνδαλα που βασανίζουν τον κλάδο τη ιστιοπλοεία. Έχει πάρει κάποια θέση ως αθλητής. Ο Κωνσταντίνος, ο Κωνσταντίνος είχε πάρα πολύ καλές σχέσεις την, με τη Σοφία Μπεκατόρου. Ε. Ε, μάλιστα, θα σας πω και μια ιστορία. Δείξατε το σκίτσο με το, ε, με το στέμα που... Το Ορνεάκι, ναι, του Πέτρου. Ναι, ναι. Ναι. Λοιπόν, μια ιστορία που δεν την ξέρετε. Ε, το, σε έναν από τους αγώνες της Πέτσες, έπαιρνε μέρος ο, ο, ο γιος του σκητσο, ο εγγονός του σκητσογράφου με ένα άλλο σκάφος και ήταν και ο Κωνσταντίνος με την Αφρόεσα. Το τιμόνι το είχε η Σοφία λένε, η Πεκατόρου και με την Αφρόεσα εμβόλισε το σκάφος του εγγονού του σκητσογράφου. Κατά λάθο, βέβαια, όχι επίτηδες. Και αμέσως όλες οι εφημερίδες γράψανε ότι ύστερα από τόσα που χρόνια πήρε εκδίκηση. Λοιπόν... Ε, στο... Ήταν άρρωστο όταν έγινε το σκάνδαλο με τη Σοφία και πιθανόν γι' αυτό να μην πήρε θέση. Βέβαια η Σοφία ήταν η μοναδική αθλήτρια 
ε, που ήταν καλεσμένη στην ε, κηδεία του Κωνσταντίνου. Ενώ αθλήτρια Ολυμπιονίκη σε υψηλό επίπεδο. Και σε μια συνέντευξη που πήγε με τον Μπαχελά, τον βαστούσε, τον βαστούσε η Σοφία, βέβαια. Αλλά λέω αν πήρε θέση για το σκάδαρο, γιατί η Σοφία ξεκίνησε και το κίνημα του Μητού στην Ελλάδα, α το πούμε. Ακριβώ. Ε, κατά τα ψέματα, ο Κωνσταντίνο τον τελευταίο χρόνο ήταν βαριά άρρωστο. Και πολύ πιθανόν γι' αυτό το λόγο να μην πήρε θέση. Forget about the comments for a second. Uh, forget about the comments for a second. Uh, Marina, you had a couple of questions you wanted to ask the panelists. Well, certainly I was interested in Nico's uh, article in Town and Country, which I recommend if anyone hasn't read it, um, about the parallels to Odysseus and the return of uh, Odysseus to his home in Ithaca. Um, I believe that there is a um, feeling of exile for those who live outside of Greece. And I was very moved by um, his return to Greece and his, his wanting to return to Greece. And I think many of our audience can relate to that feeling. Uh, I thought maybe we would reflect on how uh, Constantine's return to Elas was the fulfillment of his dream of a homecoming, much like the dream of uh, many who uh, live outside in exile and wish to return, dream to return to a loss. Yeah. I don't think anybody can deny uh, his uh, love for Greece and his love for Greek culture and Greek language um, and, um, uh, and his uh, desire to uh, be buried in, on Greeks, in Greek soil. Um, he said that to me uh, uh, eight years before his, uh, he died, and uh, which um, uh, caused me, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, moved me uh, as I'm, I've lived away from Greece and uh, I have never lost the Uh, uh, the yearning to return as much and as often as possible. Um, and uh, I wish that uh, I had never had to have been to leave. But um, uh, uh, I think history uh, will judge uh, King Constantine uh, and uh, all of us uh, um, uh, uh, will be judged by uh, those who follow us and after they have some time to reflect and uh, they would probably come up with a, a better assessment than uh, we can uh, so close to this passing. But uh, uh, from a personal point of view, he was a, a, a good man uh, and, uh, and uh, a very proud uh, Greek. Marina, to that question, I like that question, actually, because it relates, obviously, to the king. There's no doubt about it. You know, the, the return home, you know, which he was denied in certain in certain regards, coming coming as an insult with a foreign with a foreign passport. But but the same holds for us Hellenic Americans, okay, who are trying, you know, who in some cases born in Greece, trying to get Greek passports, the country that they were born in. And, the, and also for those who were not born in Greece, the constitution stated that anyone of Hellenic blood would be able to come into Greece as a citizen and the denial of our citizenship, the denial of our passports, and the same thing that was denied to the king is denied to tens of thousands around the world in the diaspora. Not only that, next week we're having a panel discussion by the orphans who are brought into the United States legally or illegally from Elas, okay, illegally or illegally, who are trying to get their Greek passports and the, and, the, and the country of their birth is denying them certain access to certain information. So this issue is a common issue. It's not only the issue of kings, it's the issue of the common Hellene, the common person of the diaspora. So when we hear about the king, and I agree with you, I'm not for kings, but when the king wants to go back, Forget about the fact that he's not a king anymore. The former, former king, king wants to be king. Former, former king. king. The former king. As a Hellene, 
as a Helene. Why is he insulted by asking him to come into Elas with a Danish passport? Because, because he has to put a surname and to create a special law just for him. A special law just for him. That's not right. Okay, I'm against kings, but that's not right. Anyway, I love that question. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Any other questions, Marina? I will have to leave you. Uh, I wish you all well. I have another appointment, and um, uh, I'll see you on the... Uh, well, well Nico, Nicholas, before you leave, just some final comments uh, on the panel or whatever. Just some final comments on your end. What? I, I just made them. I don't have anything oh. else. Okay, okay. All right, very good. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Peter, you said that some people had asked questions in the audience. Well, a couple of prominent people from the community, you know. I don't know how too. prominent they are. You got to, you don't mention names, I don't want to hear No, these people, which I thought, I think it's, uh, it's fair that we were lacking a true pro uh, monarchist pro-monarchy in the panel and, and because uh, I, I don't in, in my view I don't think any of us were spoke uh, openly Listen, for the monarchy a, so the, the reason so, why the reason you know, why I have to I have to answer that uh, Peter the reason why there are no pro-monarchists in the panel <clears throat> is because number one the monarchy was abolished okay so what are we going to do resurrect the, the monarchy I mean that's not going to happen by anybody here however I find myself, I find, because I always take contrary views to everybody else, no matter what they talk about, by the way, even though I agree with them, I had to take contrary views on this particular issue because there was so many negativity, quite frankly, about the king. But the man, he was, you know, he, it was abolished. The monarchy was abolished. Why didn't we do the right thing by healing some of the wounds, by allowing him to go back to Alas with a Hellenic passport as a regular human being, as a regular Helene, why not? Why can't we be fear normal Fear of political people? cost. The first thing that comes in mind is fear of political cost. Especially fear of what? In, going, that fear of what? In, in, light, in, light of the upcoming, in light of the upcoming elections, where the, 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 the percentages are very sensitive and every point counts, I think, uh, you know, the politicians, again, made no a one, decision, no especially, one, no especially one, the dominant party. Peter, no one is going to resurrect the monarchy. I'm just uh, expressing my view, but the view of many others, too, as well. Well, I don't know. I think in the last, they have some serious problems. I, I have to be quite frank with you. And, oh, yes. uh, and, and some of the issues sure. that we're talking about, and Peter, you were correct, that we have to talk about the Civil War. And not only the Civil War, but some of the issues that everybody alluded to, okay, which has to do with the dictatorship which has to do perhaps with the American, with the American influence within the dictatorship, the American, the American support perhaps of the dictatorship. For sure. And also, the, also the, the, the tension that's underlying a lot of things between people in the diaspora and people in Alas relating to the dictatorship. Okay, the fact that people in Alas believe that people in, in the United States, et cetera, supported the dictatorship. Okay, all these tensions exist, as we know. We have not been honest with each other to discuss these things openly with each other. We should. And we will. We will do that, right? Nico, no, no, we have to do that. Nico, uh, let's, let's do a round of final comments if we can. Yes. Um, we want to start, uh, you know, uh, Marina, we want to start with you, your, your thoughts on uh, what took place today, some of the comments that took place, whatever. Well, I think this has been a great opportunity to talk about modern Greek history and democracy, of course, um, considering that uh, Alas is the birthplace of democracy, the tragedy of the Civil War, the Second World War, the juntas, the um, struggle with uh, fighting every day for democracy, as we all do, by participating in events like this where we can discuss uh, history and uh, to make sense of, like we've all said, a very tragic and painful time. Um, I think that it's tragic that the birthplace of democracy has had so many challenges with fulfilling that dream and that mission of democracy. 
Uh, I think it's very unfair that uh, Greece had to face so many challenges to self-determination, whether it be from foreign powers, great powers, um, certainly the Greek independence, you know, from the war of independence to today has been a very rocky uh, experience with, I think it was in 11 years, 21 changes of government, 11 coups and a dictatorship. Uh, I think we need to exercise the um, democratic values and virtues that is our heritage as Hellenes and to learn from the mistakes of history and to unite and come together in consensus, which is what democracy is all about. Um, I certainly uh, am very moved that today we've had this conversation um, and I hope that it will continue to bring reconciliation, especially as an American. I think that it's tragic that the United States of America which uh, stands for democracy, was not um, stronger in its, um, in its uh, objective for Greece to have democracy and enabled any, any um, uh, counter democratic uh, movement. So um, I think as Americans and as uh, Hellenes, we have to continue to protect democracy and to uh, exercise our uh, fundamental rights, human rights. I believe that the former king was denied human rights. Uh, and I believe that many of the actions that were taken uh, were illegal and in the court of human rights would, would certainly have uh, uh, justified his, his, uh, his requests. So I think that uh, we should all be on notice to uh, exercise our civil rights and our human rights, which were uh, obtained with such great sacrifice from the people before us. And I hope that we can be true to that example um, going forward. Thank you very much, Lou, for inviting me to this no, presentation. No, 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 thank you. And, and I think- I think participating. Your, thank you. And I think to your point, and I think to Nico's point, where, where he mentioned the kings and the foreign influence, okay? The foreign influence, whether we had kings or not, including in our politicians, besides the kings, the foreign influence has not left a loss. And I remember, we all remember, where we used to, where there used to be the slogan, Elas you know, Elada Yatuselinus, etc. And we have never, we have never had that yet to this very day. With that, Spiridula, some final thoughts. Ε, τελευταία λόγια για την ημέρα. Θα ήθελα να σταθώ και εγώ λίγο στο θέμα του διαβατηρίου. Νομίζω ότι το διαβατήριο πρέπει να το πάρουν οι απογονοί του, γιατί δεν νοείται μια οικογένεια που έχει προσφέρει τόσο στην Ελλάδα, δηλαδή έχει προσφέρει σε ό,τι αφορά τους πολέμους, να μην έχει την ελληνική υπηκότητα, όταν με τα σημερινά δεδομένα την ελληνική υπηκότητα μπορεί να την πάρει ο τελευταίο. Μετανάστη, ο οποίο δεν ήρθε και με νόμιμο τρόπο στην Ελλάδα. Σα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκλησή σα να συμμετάσχω σε αυτό το πάνελ και ήταν μεγάλη μου χαρά που μίλησα με ανθρώπου που αγαπάνε την Ελλάδα ίσω περισσότερο από του Έλληνε που ζουν εδώ. Δεν ξέρω αν είναι περισσότερο ή λιγότερο. Μόνο ξέρω ότι τα passports για τη διασπορά are not coming out fast enough. And the same thing that happened to the king is happening to the so-called Έλληνες που λένε ότι εσείς είσαστε καλύτεροι Έλληνες από τους Έλληνες. Ναι, είμαστε καλύτεροι. Γιατί δεν μπορούμε να πάρουμε passports. Why can't we get passports? Okay, so part of my argument for the king, for the king, and I'm not for the king, part of my argument is give the man a passport. He self-identifies as a Hellene. Give him a passport. Why did you take it away from him? Anyway, Dimitri, final thoughts. Είναι ακριβώς το ίδιο που σας λέω και εγώ. Πέντε passport. Ο τελευταίο Πακιστανό που έρχεται λατρέα στην Ελλάδα και δεν μπορούν να πάρουν διαβατήριο, ε, οι Έλληνε. Αυτό είναι άσχημο πράγμα. Και φταίει η κυβέρνηση γιατί, όπω είπαμε, φοβούνται. Φοβούνται. Τι φοβούνται, Φοβούνται του Έλληνε που είναι καλύτεροι από του Έλληνε. <laughs> Δημήτρη. Γκρίση uh, history is very complicated. Of course. Very complex, as you know and modern history even more so. Um, 
Constantinos himself was aware of this complexity and he was aware of his own mistakes. Uh, to a certain extent, he admitted to them. Πιστεύω ότι αγαπούσε την Ελλάδα και το έδειξε με διάφορου τρόπου. Οπωσδήποτε τα νομικά και πολιτικά θέματα, legal political ramifications are always present. And I do believe that the Mitsotakis administration decision about the funeral would have been different if it was not an election year in Greece. Uh, I'm not saying that it is uh, uh, not correct. I believe that it is correct, but um, maybe some military honors would have been uh, accosted to him uh, in accordance with his uh, uh, service in the armed forces of the country. Uh, beyond that, uh, the issues raised by, by everyone in the panel were very interesting. And uh, I believe uh, that at the end, the undoing of the monarchy uh, had to do not only with the influence of the foreign powers, but uh, with the fact that with the exception of King Alexander II, uh, the kings of Greece uh, did, and maybe perhaps to Otto, the first king to, uh, to an extent, the history of the monarchy uh, did not contribute to uh, put Greece in the path of progress and unity for the Hellenic nation. And that is true. Uh, as uh, for Kosadinos, I said in the beginning that he was a tragic figure. And uh, yes, homecoming as an ambitious, it's partially true because he did love Greece and he wanted to die in Greece. But um, on the other hand, uh, there were so many uh, uh, things and so many wrongs uh, that the royal family over the years and over many things uh, have done. Uh, in conclusion, I believe that we uh, have uh, aired many of the aspects and the facets of uh, the monarchy, the modern monarchy in Greece and uh, the uh, traumas of the civil war and the most recent uh, uh, Greek history in the last uh, few decades, especially the years of the junta and uh, the reconstruction of Greece as a Hellenic Republic after the fall of the junta. Thank, thank you, Dimitri. There's, <clears throat> there's no doubt that the uh, monarchy within, um, within Alas was uh, dictated by foreign powers. There's no doubt that the, um, that the monarchy itself historically has had a checkered past that we discussed. You know, out of seven monarchs, three were deposed, we said, one assassinated, two abdicated. And there's no doubt in many cases that they were, they were on the side of, of, of others, okay? Whether it was the Bavarian, uh, Bavarianocracy, you know, when Otto was there, King Otto was there. And then you had the bloodless, uh, let's say, uh, revolution of 18, 1843, I think it was. Uh, there have been always serious issues, including up to Constantine, okay? My only point of this was not uh, in support of monarchies, which I'm not, you know, being raised in America, you can't be in support of monarchies because effectively we fought against monarchies. But my, my whole issue had to do with the end, basically, and not allowing the person who self-identified as a Hellene to, to finally be able to come to a nation as a Hellene and not come with a foreign passport because also, you know, I look at it from the point of view of the diaspora and how they are treated by the country of their, in many cases, the country of their birth. Well, we are, we are, um, they say good things about us and all the rest of that. They come to, the, they come to the United States asking for money, this and that, support Allah, this is where you come from, et cetera. And then when we try to get passports, what have you, all of a sudden it takes years and some people basically give up. So I'm, I'm in total agreement with that. Uh, Peter Pano, uh, final- Listen, I quickly, I quickly want to say something which I forgot to say. 
uh, during the time of Constantine I, when he was in exile, I think it was six years or something before they, he was brought back, Venizelos made an attempt uh, to, to get in touch with the direct uh, descendants of the Byzantine dynasty, especially a family of Lascari, Lascare Comini, who live in, uh, um, in Madrid and South America. And I personally had the opportunity to get in touch with them, but he was, it, he was not allowed to do that by the grand powers of the time. Anyway, this is, I just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, listen, the topic is fair complete. At this point, there's no mon monarchy. I'm okay with that, but I, I still believe that the family of the former king can play a role, a philanthropic role. And I spoke about philanthropy and I was referring mostly to Nicolas. He's really doing something which, uh, you know, I, it, you can look it up, you can Google it and see what he's, he's doing. So I think they can play some kind of a role. I do believe that they love Greeks and they just have to be given the opportunity to, to show it not only in Greece, but globally. That's it. Cesar. Thank you, Peter. And Nico, some final, some final thoughts. First of all, uh, to, not, not to forget that um, Constantine was ready to do a coup himself with the generals, but the colonels, you know, came came earlier. You know, <laughs> so don't forget. <laughs> So uh, as far as concerned, uh, uh, I would like to say two things. So, uh, one will be humorous, my last word. But the second one is we have to reconsider the concept of citizenship in, 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 in our modern times. Uh, at this moment, the people who are exiled or, or uh, they, they are pushed away from where, where they lived, they are, they are numerically more than uh, altogether in previous uh, eras. So, so many people are, 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 are disposed, are, are forced to leave uh, their countries and places of, of birth. So, this unique situation that happens in, in our modern era. So, there are millions of people with no uh, uh, status. So, it's not, it's not only this particular example that you, we're discussing today, but it, it is a serious problem, the concept of citizenship. And also for Greece, the concept of citizenship within the European Union, which is uh, another delicate uh, 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 matter, and and to and to leave us uh, with a, you know a happy note is that I was very um, unsettled uh, when I read uh, the uh, the headlines, the newspapers uh, saying uh, the last king of Greece. All these years, I thought I was the last. The last king of Greece, because this is what my grandmother used to tell me all the time that I am the king. <laughs> so I am the last uh, king of Greece for our uh, pro royalist uh, uh, friends. So don't worry, there are more Greeks if you want uh, to, to support some. Yeah. Well, l listen, as, a, as a, a descendant of Cleftus in the mountains, okay, who had no kings and, and, and couldn't care for sultans. Obviously, the imposition of, of foreigners into, into a nation where our blood was spilled was dysfunctional. Unfortunately, it came at a time when, when monarchies ruled the world and they imposed this on the Hellenic We Republic. could name Kolokotronis as a king, uh, as uh, <laughs> Nico said, it could have been accepted uh, by all Hellenes. Well, if you, if you remember, Dimitri, Kolokotronis was the one that suggested at some point and supported the king, even though, even though the king even though the king put him in jail, wanted to put him in jail, actually. In, jail. And, in his and, name, he was uh, he was uh, condemned to death. Thank God. Uh, that's that's, a, that's exactly uh, correct. <laughs> anyway, so this this was a fascinating discussion by a great panel. Thank you, Marina, for co-moderating this. It was fantastic. Thank you, Spiridula. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank Peter. You. Next week we're going to have another another fantastic panel relating relating to the um, the adoptees and the and the issue of nostos. Okay, the concept of nostos that we talk about in this this yearning this yearning that we talked about for all Hellenes to go back to their country of their birth if they want to, and uh, the denial in many cases, you know, which is similar to some of the discussion we had today. 
uh, by, by people who were brought not only to the United States, but also to Denmark and other countries, and either legally or illegally. Obviously, a lot of these um, adoptees were, uh, again, this related to the Civil War in many cases. It related to uh, issues of the past, which, uh, which had to do with people getting married, not married, a woman getting pregnant and all the rest of that. It related to poverty, where some families had to give up their children so others can, uh, others can support them because they were afraid and they thought perhaps in another nation that they would have a better life, whether, whether in the United States or whatever. These are tragic circumstances, but in some ways that discussion links to the discussion that we had today. So to the audience, join us. Thank you to, to the fantastic panel that we have. Thank you, Marina. And uh, have a pleasant evening. Spiridula, because I know it's late in, uh, in Athens right now. And to everybody, have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.